He loves to make things. He's a creator. Well, I don't think there ever was a species like him. He's, you know, he's an unusual guy. Thorough analysis and thorough thinking, I think, is what made him so successful in inventing. That was the so-called Quinton shunt that was first used in a chronic patient. He's probably the original bioengineer. Medical historians know about it, but not all that many other people. He will tell you he has more of an engineering mind than a mind for interpersonal relationships. He succeeded out of his humble background in Rigby, Idaho, mm -hmm. and uh, has gone on to do great things with his life. And that is a great story to me. In 1960, Wayne Quinton was at the right place at the right time. He put together a system which made a disease which previously was uniformly fatal treatable. The difference the shunt made was to make treatment of chronic irreversible kidney failure possible. Medical historians know about it, but not all that many other people. Rigby was a Mormon community. Well, there were two kinds of people in Rigby. Those that went to church and those that didn't. And my family did not. My mother and father are buried there, but, um, it's been a long time since I've been there. Dad had a business which was, we called it the Rigby Dray and Storage Company. If you had something you wanted to move, why well, he'd go pick it up and move it. Or if you had something you wanted to store, he had a place to store it. Dad had an elevator in this building we ride up and down in the elevator. Dad had purchased a little airplane with an electric motor in it. When he turned the electric motor on, it turned the propeller, and the thing went around a circle. And I'd sit and watch that for quite a while. He was really a very good father. Um, at the time, I didn't appreciate how good he was, but I did later. Well, Mother was an unusual woman in the sense that she really was not what you'd call a born mother. She was a businesswoman. She worked as a telephone operator in St. Anthony, Idaho, when she was very young. And she had a telephone book with all the telephones in Utah, Idaho, Montana, a whole bunch of places. She kept her threads for her embroidery work in that book. The thing that stands out most clearly in my mind about my mother early on, when I was still very young, was she was a bookkeeper for a grocery store. What would happen is they would buy or go to the counter and say, I want a can of something. They would put the money in a little red car that went on a string up to mother, and they would pull the lever, and this little car would go shooting up to the top. Mother would take the money out of it, make the change, and shoot it back. And she'd take me there occasionally, and I had great fun pulling the trigger on this thing to send it back. That's a vivid memory I have of my mother and her working and taking me to work. The early years that I remember living with my stepfather and my mother were really very pleasant. I enjoyed those. And then suddenly it changes. 
In the beginning of the Depression, Dad had lost his business. Mother had lost her job. And uh, we ended up in this cabin and a little farm that hadn't been lived in for many years. We uh, went from living in this small town of Rigby to living on a small ranch three miles from Rigby. And I was suddenly in an environment in which I had no knowledge of. I was eight years old. We were on our own, and we had to make things work. The house was one of the early cabins that had been built by the pioneers. And the first thing we had to do was uh, fill the cracks between the logs so the wind wouldn't blow through without impediment. There was a lot of repair work that had to be done on that. I spent a lot of time helping Dad. I was the only child, so we dug a well. There was no running water. If I was cold, I had to go out to the wood pile, carry in the wood, put it in the stove, make sure that it burned. And my dad used to say, well, you get warm twice. Once when you chop it, and once when you burn it. We had gotten moved in, and Mother and Dad and I were sitting on the bed. There was one bed, and then it was a cot that I slept on. And Dad was talking about the future for us. And he said, we're going to be all right this winter because we have rolled oats, some rice, and we have a ham. And the interesting thing about the ham was that it spoiled. How could a ham spoil? It's supposed to not spoil, but it did. Sometimes we had oatmeal for breakfast, and then we had fried oatmeal for lunch. Dinner was sometimes oatmeal. I still have a little trouble eating oatmeal. We still had some resources which Mother had gotten when we had money. And one of them was a subscription to Saturday Evening Post. And the Saturday Evening Post had wonderful stories in it. And so it would come every week, and we had a big gasoline lantern. We had no electricity. We had oil lamps. My job was to light the light. And then Dad would read to us. I think we all enjoyed was called Mountain Man. It was a story of a young man, a relative to Daniel Boone, and he came west to be a mountain man. I had a little 22 rifle that uh, somewhere I'd acquired. This mountain man guy was a great shot, and so I tried to become a good shot, too. I was an absolute disaster when it came to playing games. I was nearsighted and I could not see the ball, so I couldn't hit it, so I was an automatic out. Nobody wanted me on their team, so very often I got to play way out there for both teams. I found that it was a lot easier for me to conceive of and build something than it was to play games and that sort of thing. I didn't have a childhood. I mean, I spent most of my time doing something that might be considered productive. I got several jobs. I had a job working in a service station. Sugar factory, farming activities, the roofing company, digging ditches, any kind of repair work, the projectionist. Sometimes uh, the pay was all the popcorn you could eat. Sweeping the high school building, 
The best part of that was that the janitor would let us have a hot shower. Now, when you live in a place with no running water, believe me, a hot shower <laughs> is to die for, really. Uh, I was working in the blacksmith shop as well. And in a blacksmith shop, you do a lot of pounding and sledgehammering and all this sort of thing. So you get pretty good at hitting things. Well, I don't remember why I was there, but I was in this field, and they were playing a kind of a pickup game of baseball. And they didn't have a regular baseball. They had a big rubber white, about the same size as a softball, but it wasn't softball. So I got up there, and I saw this great big white thing coming at me. And I loaded every ounce of strength I had into that bat, swung it, and the ball literally exploded and fell down on the ground. <laughs> Ended the game, because that's the only ball I had. And I think that's my last interest in playing. I have a talent for seeing how you can take this piece and that piece and put it together and make it do what you want to do. There's a thing called a McCormick Deering binder. cuts off the grain, gathers it up, and then ties a string around it. Well, Dad borrowed one of these, and it didn't tie the string tight enough so that you didn't have a shock that you could pick up and carry anywhere. So I thought to myself, there's got to be some way. It did it once. Why can't it do it again? What had happened was the cam had worn down. And so I wrapped the cam with baling wire. Baling wire is the main tool for fixing farm machinery. <laughs> and wrapped that around the cam, and what do you know, it tied the bundle. Dad described himself as a jack of all trades and master of none, but he, I never saw him tackle a job that didn't get done. And uh, he seemed totally unafraid to try things he had never done. And I think I got that same feeling from him that if it needs to be done, get busy and do it, even if you don't know how. The town of Rigby, Idaho, had about an acre and a half or so of what they called a junkyard. There was lots of Model Ts in various forms of disrepair, and the only way you could repair them was you had to have the part or make the part. So I went to the junkyard and sorted out the cars that still had good parts and, and sort of disassembled and threw away some and assembled and got a car that would run. If I'd kept that thing, it'd be worth a lot of money today, but it sure wasn't worth anything then. <laughs> General Motors uh, had a, a division called Fisher Body, and this particular year, they had a new car design contest, and I entered that. I built it on a dining room table, and I expanded the body so that it covered up the wheels, and that increased the inserts. So theoretically, you could get four people in the car. It was a junior contest for new car design, and I won that. I. I think, in reality, I had no fear of failure. Dad had a heart attack 
when I was going to my first day of high school. And uh, they put him to bed and told him to stay there for the rest of his life. Mother taught me something one time. We were living on this little farm. Dad was in bed. Uh, we had three cows, which I milked. And then we collected the cream and churned it with a hand crank churner. I dreamed about making a steam engine to turn it, but decided it took too much work to chop the wood for the steam engine, so I continued to crank it. Mother had two pounds of butter. She would take the butter and form it into pound bricks. She put on a coat that was still in good condition. Walked three miles to get to town to sell to her friends who still had income these two pounds of butter. Now, I don't imagine she got more than $2 for the lunch, but she had to walk six miles, and she had to face people who had been her equals or less when they were still in situations where they were better off financially than she was. And I think that proved to me that mother felt strongly enough about taking care of her family, that pride was not something she worried about. Maybe that doesn't affect anybody else, but it was touching to me. People all over Idaho, Montana, Utah, to hire people with technical backgrounds to come to work for them. Week after Pearl Harbor, I went to work for Boeing, and I ended up as the chief planner for the B-29 airplane Bombay section. So I went out to the shop where the foreman was going to be building my section of the airplane, and I said, hey, I need your help. I'm planning this airplane assembly. I never seen an airplane that wasn't made out of wood and canvas, so I need your help. And they said, well, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from upstairs. And they said, oh, get out of here. We don't talk to them, and they don't talk to us. And it took me a week of going back and saying, yeah, I'm here, help, before they really believed in me as being willing to need their advice and help. And that result was that when they helped me and I understood what the production plan was about, that the Bombay section, when they got into production, went through so fast and so quick that we had to shut down production because we couldn't store them all. That was a learning experience for me as far as Teamwork is the only way you can accomplish these things. I tried to 
perpetuate that concept in all the business activities I've been in. The Enola Gay, an American bomber named after the pilot's mother, takes off from the Pacific airstrip on August 6th. The lives of American fighting men are the president's concern, but as years pass, historians will question America's use of the atomic bomb. It wasn't my decision to use the B-29. It wasn't my decision. I knew they were building a bomb, but I didn't know much about it. It was later on that I read about it. My fellow Americans, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. Well, about that time, my dad passed away. So I re resigned and went back to Idaho to help mother in the dry cleaning plant. She decided to sell the plant. And so I went back to Seattle. So I applied for a job as an electronics technician. Totally unqualified, but you know, immaterial. And it turned out that the, man, the uh, job was to work with uh, Dr. Lauren Carlson. He had designed and developed the oxygen mask for the people who flew the B-17. He sensed that I loved to solve problems and could do so. We built a special suit that um, we could tell how much heat you lost. So we were able to study the heat balance in people exposed to cold. In the warm weather, we devised devise equipment. In cold weather, in the wintertime, we'd go up to Alaska and stand around and get cold. Then we'd record all that information and then come back and analyze it. Apparently, I did a satisfactory job. The University of Washington Medical School was in its beginning period. They wanted to have a medical instrument shop, and they wanted somebody to run it. Lauren Carlson was on the committee to select the man who would be in charge of this, and they interviewed me. And they said, okay, you will be head of the instrument shop on trial. As I recall, they never did tell me I was hired permanently. I was not academic, so technically I was not supposed to wear a white coat. But I figured I was every bit as good an engineer and a fabricator of pieces to as they were physicians, so I was entitled to a white coat. So I got a white coat. Dr. Scribner, who was the head of the uh, Division of Nephrology at the University of Washington, had a program for the treatment of acute kidney failure that he had developed. Up to that point, for acute kidney failure, every time the patient was treated, the artery and the vein had to be cut down on. And so, within a few weeks, there were no vessels left in the arm or leg that were available, so that long-term treatment uh, was not possible. And in those days, that was the end. The patient was sent home to die. It all changed in 1960. I had done a lot of devices in blood uh, connections and this sort of thing. And one of the things I knew from a practical standpoint is that uh, blood in a cadaver clots. And it's lack of motion that makes it clot. So if you keep it moving, it doesn't clot. Wayne immediately understood the whole thing and uh, within a few days had come up with a plan for a device that would uh, allow the repeated use of the same artery and vein. Scribner said, okay, let's try it. 
I developed a kind of a sheep shank arrangement thing that went through a 180 degree turn and cooked up a little uh, connection system so that we could connect it mechanically to the kidney. The shunt itself consisted of two cannulas, two, two tubings, each of which had a tapered tip which was entered into one into the radial artery uh, in the forearm close to the wrist and the other into a forearm vein. In 1960, Clyde Shields was a 39-year-old mechanic uh, who had chronic kidney failure. At the point where Clyde started dialysis, his uh, life expectancy at that point was probably not more than two weeks at the outside. I was scrubbed in on the operations to make certain that everything went away according to, according to the way I wanted it to go, and that I made the parts on site so that they fit exactly. At the end of the treatment, the cannulas were disconnected from the artificial kidney, and a semicircular piece of Teflon was used to connect the arterial cannula to the venous cannula and blood flow through the shunt and kept the system open until the next treatment. That was the so-called Scribner shunt or the Scribner Quinton shunt um, that was first used in a chronic patient on March the 9th, 1960. We got all through and nobody hooked Clyde up to the dialyzer. So everybody's gone and I'm there with Clyde uh, well, I thought the, in, the intention was to dialyze him, so I hooked him up. And uh, that started the dialysis, and sometime later he got feeling well enough that he went home and had a pleasant birthday party. There are somewhere between one and two million people around the world today who have been treated with dialysis as a result of what happened in Seattle in 1960. I was wandering around uh, the, the subterranean parts of the school, and I came across a little uh, cranny that said, medical instrument shop. And I went in and looked, and, and there was this non-talkative guy who was the head of it, Wayne, and I, I said, you know, I, I just came here. He said, oh, what do you do? And I told him. And he says, you're all set up. I said, I haven't got anything. I haven't got any money. He says, well, what do you do and what do you have to do? He says, well, you know, I, I, I make instruments for all these doctors, and I know where everything is hidden. Let's go around and pick up all the stuff you need. So we traveled from morning to night. Guess what? I had a laboratory by evening. <laughs> one day he sent one of his interns or his students down to see if I could develop a system that would store a biopsy. Uh, it was named the hydraulic uh, biopsy tube, and it was described first with a rough diagram, and it, helped, it really established me, and to this day, it, it's important. Well, the biopsy tube was about six feet long, and it had a tiny tube in it, and it had a little knife that went in there. You applied a negative pressure, which sucked the tissue into the tube, and then you turned on the water pressure. The pressure closed the knife, and then the water pressure went through the knife and washed the biopsy out. Having something that would just, where you go, that's in your hand, and incredible. We worked very closely together, but the real constructive and uh, amazing things that were done were because of his brain and his ability to understand my problem and to convert it into a, a workable method by his bioengineering. He was a microengineer. He was really the first bioengineer. It's unfortunate that he's the same age as I am. They we're both getting old, we're neither one really active in what we did best. 
Wayne had the capacity to look at a problem and uh, to look at many possible uh, solutions that could be adapted to deal with the problem. Perhaps his other big achievement in the healthcare field was that he and Dr. Robert Bruce at the University of Washington developed the treadmill that's used now by cardiologists all over the world. And Bob Bruce wanted to do exercise stress testing, but the treadmills he could buy were so large and so heavy that the hospital building that he was functioning in could not support the treadmill. So he came to me and said, can you build a lightweight treadmill? And I had already built a lightweight treadmill to take up in the Arctic. I made the treadmill small so that you could stand them up in the corner. And I also made a lightweight one that he could use in his main laboratory. People would write to us and say, uh, how do I get a treadmill? Like the one you're using. I guess the best way is I'll make you one. Eventually it got to the place where the number of treadmills being built um, made a fairly decent income. So I decided that I would start a little company that would make treadmills for stress testing. I think we became the largest equipment manufacturer of stress testing equipment in the business. Well, uh, I was his attorney and his friend and um, his running partner. We first met when I was in law school and he was uh, doing his engineering degree. He called one day and asked me if I knew how to set up a corporation, and away we went. I started Quentin Instrument Company. Started in my basement, went from my basement to a thousand square foot storefront place, doubled that building, built another building, bought a building and ran out of money. <laughs> he had brilliant mind, immediately apparent, but um, uh, not any experience in running a company or even knowing how to uh, work with people in an employer-employee way. He'd always been the employee. I think there were a lot of difficult times in growing that company from being in his garage to 20 years later, employing 700 people and $100 million worth of sales a year. We were losing money at a fairly vigorous rate because the interest rates had gone up. And on top of that, we needed better financial management. Wayne's wife, Judy, herself a very keen intellect and very important to the growth of that business. She paid the bills and uh, took in the receivables and uh, managed that side of the business while Wayne did the technical and creative side. Initially, my wife had been helpful in the sales work. She was an actor by interest, and she did very well at talking to people and this sort of thing. The problem was that the problem products got more technical than she was able to handle. And children were getting to where they needed more help. Uh, they did have financial stresses and money management became a very significant um, concern. So the time came that uh, Wayne made the decision that he must have a highly experienced CPA level a uh, financial person uh, who could be chief financial uh, officer of that organization, and that that person would have to be someone then that Judy would report to, and I know that that was a deep concern in their marriage. Eventually, at about the time the company was being sold, uh, their marriage 
uh, was dissolved. And I know that that was a hard thing for both of them. So I made the changes. Difficult, unpleasant, but necessary. And so in some ways we sacrificed our personal relationship on the altar of a good business. I think that he certainly exemplifies the fact that there's going to be some rough road in every life. And uh, uh, that just goes with the territory. I never really in hindsight said I'd like to have done it differently. You learn something and then you use what you've learned to do it better. But there's no going back. You can't go back. Our family went up to visit my sister Jean uh, on Thanksgiving in 1976 as she uh, was running her uh, first marathon. And uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Wayne because uh, Wayne happened to be right running that marathon also. We became very close friends. When I went back up uh, to help my sister rejuvenate her home, she, uh, Wayne would come over and we would visit and talk, uh, but invariably the conversation would end up uh, around my sister and I knew really why Wayne really wanted to talk. Well, I can tell you the first time I saw him, he was in church and I remember he was giving a little speech, a little talk, and he was very funny. And I had seen him around, and he was kind of, I thought, quiet. But he was hilarious, and I thought, hmm. I learned that uh, as time goes on, you, you get older, you have to give up things. And uh, that's not always fun, but you have to understand that that's what you do. I don't run marathons anymore. I can't run up two flights of stairs. You know, uh, there are physical things you can't do. You have to be willing to accept these limitations and still make the best of what you got. Frankly, I can't remember his saying, will you marry me on his knees or anything. But he said, um, I've just been to Vienna or someplace he'd been where they had good chocolate. And he said, I had the best. I had chocolate mousse in a chocolate cup, and it was the best. And he said, that's what I think about you, the best. <laughs> I thought, whoa, that was really nice. <laughs> Jean has brought to me a wonderful sense of love and acceptance, and she has made me understand a lot of things about other people, about associating with people, about doing things for people, which is much more emphatic or more effective than what I've done. He will tell you he has more of an engineering mind than a mind for interpersonal relationships. And um, I think he's done very well myself. All of my children just adore him. You know, the in-laws, the grandchildren. Everywhere I look, I can see something he has done to make my life easier. He made this spoon for me, flat with a slant, so I can get into the corners of the pan. He comes up with these three square folders so that you can fold a perfect 
paper every time. He came up with this little pump that fits just right into the hole. It's all made out of copper, and I can just pump more lotion into these little bottles. Jeannie's very good at teaching people. I think she stimulates me to do things that I wouldn't normally do. We are very opposite in a lot of ways. He is very realistic. I tend to be more romantic and idealistic, and it's a good match. There's a lot of difference between us. She loves music, I don't. don't. I love to sing around the piano. He doesn't like to sing around the piano. We're different in the sense of age. We come from a totally different social background. The thing that I have done in the world of medicine and all that sort of thing, and a lot of the other stuff I've done, have been to help people. But it doesn't bring them the same joy that being to a party with Jeannie does. I've known them since 1981 when I was a staff accountant at P. Marwick. And then when I left, then they continued with me. Do you want to tell us about the carousel? that you made, and you can stay, you can stay seated here. The carousel back here that everyone was admiring as you're standing in line. Well, I bought a little steam engine, and um, <clears throat> I needed something for it to do. He always has a project. He's very analytical as, as well in all, in everything he's doing, very thorough. So I thought if I made a carousel, I could hook the steam engine to it. And that would justify buying a steam engine. <laughs> One thing I've learned is that no matter what anybody says about me, if they say something nice, it doesn't change who I am. If they say something mean, that doesn't change me either. I think I know who I am. And I'm just comfortable with that. Dwayne. I think the rest of us can learn from Wayne that you never accept the status quo. You can always make things better. And that you are as qualified as anybody to do so. Wayne has been very fulfilled in his life, but it really hasn't been easy. It may seem like it's easy, but he's had to fight a lot of intense battles. And he's survived 90 years. Here he is. What I love about Wayne is, um, his mind is always working. He's always trying to invent some new device that he thinks will help, help people. I have enjoyed my life enormously. And it's my birthday wish that all of you would have the same feeling about your life. It doesn't come easily, you have to earn it, but it's a great feeling if you're satisfied with what you've done. And uh, I think I've run out of things to say, <laughs> except have a good evening, have more fun, and thanks again for coming. I think my demise or my exit from this world is not too far distant. And I think it will be very interesting to see what's available in the next one. And I hope that it's an opportunity to ask, ask some questions, which I, nobody seems to know the answer to. But I hope that I'm given a chance to learn some of the answers that I don't know and can't find out now. I can't tell you why, but as long as I can remember, it's been a fascination with mechanical devices. I have always enjoyed building things. Engineers constantly look at something and say, we could make it better.
think God needs a good engineer on the other side? <laughs> well, the statement's made that he created the world. Now, by golly, if that's not a good engineer, there's something wrong with your attitude. 